And I do have a subject I want to share with you tonight. It's a very simple subject. And my title is simply, Fear Not. And I take my text from Psalm chapter 56 and verse 3. The psalmist wrote these words, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Now, fear is an emotion. It's induced by perceived danger or threat. And that fear causes physiological changes like accelerated breathing and heart rate and tension in the muscles and goosebumps and butterflies in the stomach, all of that. And it also causes behavioral changes, things like fleeing or hiding or even being so afraid that you freeze in place from perceived traumatic events. Fear in human beings may occur in response to something in the present or in anticipation of a future threat. Many fears are rational and appropriate, but an irrational fear can become a phobia. Now, I'm not a fearful person, and it struck me this week, thinking about the weekend and these two services, that I have never preached a message on fear Um, in all of these years of ministry, probably as a result of not being a fearful person. It's maybe a blind spot for me. Um, Because I'm not fearful, I tend to leave the, uh, the angst and the anxiety and the panic and the paranoia and the worry and the drama to other people because so many of them are so very good at all of that. My personal motto is something like my British ancestors. It's very simple. Keep calm and carry on. But all that being said, in our generation, many people, especially right now, are struggling with fear. It's not just because of the current coronavirus pandemic. No, many of these people were already struggling long before they got that terrible news. Getting a viral infection is now just one more worry at the top of a very long list of fears that have plagued them for a long time. Financial fears job fears, relationship fears, parental fears, health fears, so many fears. Now, we believe in using wisdom, and we believe in being careful. But having said that, we refuse to be governed by fear. Caution is certainly well advised during a time like this, a viral outbreak. We are listening and heeding all the requirements and recommendations But church, hysteria and panic is not helpful, and it is not biblical. God is still on his throne. The blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, still saves us and heals us. The devil and hell are still defeated, and this church is still victorious. We are not fatalistic. We are filled with faith. After all, what is the worst that can happen to a child of God? You're going to get to heaven earlier than all the rest of us, and that's supposed to be bad? Here's what Jesus said. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do. The worst the devil can do is attack your physical life, but you have an eternal life. Your spirit is hid with Christ in God. And so in the scripture, we need to pay attention to what the scripture says about fear, not just what our culture says about fear. In the scripture, the term fear means everything that we think it does. It means alarmed and frightened and intimidating. But, but in the scripture, the word fear also has an additional sense. It's an unusual thing. The, the, the sense of awe or reverence. And this is because we fear things that are bigger or stronger, or more powerful than we are. We revere them. We're in awe of them. Things that can hurt and harm and damage us. Things that can rob our joy and steal our peace. We're in awe of them. We we hold them in in, in healthy uh, reverence and healthy fear. It's good to have a healthy level of concern about many things. But brothers and sisters, it is never good to let fear rule your life. To put it simply, the big things that you are so afraid of in your life, whatever they may be today, those big things that are tormenting you are much smaller than your God. 
Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, the fear of man, see that's where you get that fear focused on the wrong thing. The fear of man, it brings a snare. It'll tie you up. It'll bind up your emotions. It'll mess up your mind. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 9, 10, the most familiar verse in that book The fear of the Lord. See, that's reverence or awe or respect for the ultimate power, for the ultimate big person in the galaxy. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And there are some people today, I know because I felt this for you today. There are some people listening to me right now and you do need deliverance from a spirit of fear that is trying to control you. Deliverance in the Holy Scripture simply means escape. Israel was delivered from Egypt. Uh, Many times they were delivered from battles and from enemies. Deliverance simply means escape. And you need a way out because you cannot keep living the way you've been living. You cannot keep living with the anxiety and the panic attacks and all of the depression and doubt and fear that you have been living with. My advice to you is sometime tonight before you pillow your head, sometime tomorrow and every day this week while you're kind of sequestered at home, my advice is to close your internet browser once in a while and open up your Bible because in the word of God, there are supernatural words that can deliver you and give you a way of escape. The psalmist wrote this, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. God wants to deliver somebody from fear. I'm not saying don't be careful. I'm saying don't fear. I'm not saying don't listen or ignore good advice. I'm saying don't you dare panic. I'm not saying that you shouldn't obey all the restrictions and all the requirements. I'm just simply saying that You should not let your life be ruled and governed by a spirit of fear. The most common command in the entire Bible is the command, fear not. Now that doesn't seem very helpful at first. Fear not. I can say that to you all day. Fear not, and it doesn't seem very helpful. It seems a lot like commanding a terrified child. Cry not. Or like commanding a sick person, hurt not. It doesn't seem very compassionate. It seems a bit heartless and uncaring. That is, until you realize that the most common command in the Bible, fear not, is almost always accompanied by the most common promise in the Bible. And the most common promise in your Bible is not, I will fix everything or I will heal everything or I will do everything you want, or I will answer every prayer you pray. No, the most common command in the Bible is, I will be with you. It may not always be easy or enjoyable, but I will be with you. You may not always be healthy or wealthy, but I will be with you. The world may misunderstand and mock you, but I will be with you. The devil may viciously fight your progress at every turn you make and every step you take. But God said, fear not, for I will be with you. He spoke to the prophet Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Here it is. Fear not. That's God's command. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Don't give in to the paranoia. Fear not. For I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. You are not just a random human being being beat around by culture and circumstances. You are a child of God. And so God says, when you pass through the waters, here it is, I will be with thee. And when you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Notice what the prophet said. You will pass through some rough waters and you will endure the heat of some rough fires. But that's the point. You will pass 
through it. You will get through it. And when you get on the other side of your situation and you turn around and you look back down the road where God has led you and guided you and sustained you, you will then realize that the very reason the river didn't drown you and the fire didn't burn you is because God was with you every step of the way. Isaiah 41, fear thou not, there it is again. For I am with thee. There it is again. The most common command and the most common promise of scripture twin together, join together in God's beautiful, powerful promise. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That is God's promise to you. You remember the people we call the three Hebrew boys. They really weren't boys. They were young adults. But we call them the three Hebrew boys. And you remember when they were in Babylon, they were captives in a foreign land, and they didn't have it good. They didn't have it easy. And then someone got jealous of them and decided to turn them into the pagan king. You know this story. You learned it in Sunday school. And so that king decides he's going to create a burning, fiery furnace. And anybody who will not bow and worship him and his image, they will be cast into the flames. And finally, somebody tells on the boys that they're not bowing, they're not worshiping that image. And so they're dragged in before that pagan king. And they stand there in his courtroom before a man. This is ancient times. This isn't democracy. This isn't fair judicial process. This is ancient times. With one flick of his little finger, he can banish them to death. He can put them in prison. Or he can have them burned to a crisp in this roaring inferno. If anything would make those boys turn around, reconsider, be a little cautious and afraid, it should have been that. But here's their answer to that pagan king. If it be so, if God lets that happen, king, if God lets you throw us in that fire, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will still not serve your gods. We will still not worship the golden image which you have set up. King, here's the bottom line for us. Our God is able to deliver us from any situation we face. And furthermore, he's going to deliver us. He might not deliver us today, but he's going to deliver us out of your hand regardless. If God delivers us from the furnace, We're out of your hands. But if God delivers us by letting us be burned up in the furnace, we're still in your hands. I don't think they saw the third option coming. They were so bold and so brave. Suddenly the king looked over the edge of that roaring inferno and here's what he said. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God saw saw those brave Hebrew boys in that furnace. They would not back down from glorifying the name of the Lord. They would not turn and worship a pagan image. And up in heaven, God said, those are brave boys. I think I'm going to go down and walk in that furnace with them. And as soon as God got anywhere near, obviously all the bonds were loosed. And all of a sudden, there's three boys plus a man, a form who's like the son of God walking around in that furnace flame. Those boys didn't know that was coming. They didn't know the form of their deliverance or their miracle. They didn't understand what God was going to do. All they saw was two options. They said, King, God can deliver us from the furnace so we don't have to go in, or we may die in the furnace and we're out of your hands either way. But they didn't see the third option, that God himself could intervene in the middle of that situation and God could be with them in the middle of the trial. 
I want to speak to somebody because here's what I know. There are people that are dealing with disease for many, many weeks and months in our congregation. It's not coronavirus. It's not a pandemic. They've been dealing with this for months. And we know and we believe that God is able to heal instantly and completely any disease, any sickness, any condition. And we also know that even if he doesn't, we're still going to serve him, we're still going to worship him, and we're still going to keep our faith and our integrity. But I want you to be on the lookout for the third option. It is possible that God can walk right into the middle of your situation, right into the middle of your circumstance, right into the middle of your sickness and your disease, and he can do the miraculous and use you in ways that you cannot even imagine. I've been thrilled this week by all the reports. So many people, dozens of people. We haven't had church services in the United Pentecostal Church this week except online. But this week, so many have been baptized in Jesus' name. And so many have been filled with the Holy Ghost. They've been driving up to churches. I got one report today from the state of California. The associate pastor in that church, he hadn't seen a friend for 20 years since high school. And he got a call and the call said, I need to be baptized. That was yesterday. So he said, well, come tomorrow. We're going to have an online service and I'll be glad to baptize you. The guy said, you don't understand understand. I'm sitting in the parking lot right now, and if I have to sleep in my car, I'm going to stay here until somebody baptizes me in Jesus' name. One church in Missouri, they heard this knock on the office door. Just the staff was there in the middle of the day. They opened the door. There was a man laying on their office step. The building was locked up, of course, and he was repenting. He said, I got to get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. God can do amazing, miraculous things in the middle of our circumstance. God walked with those boys in the middle of that furnace. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8 says, and the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. There it is again. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. So here it is again. Fear not neither be dismayed. The most common command and the most common promise in the scripture. What is the opposite of fear? Most of us would say courage or calm or confidence or bravery. And the thesaurus would back us up with those kinds of words. But as you might expect, the scripture has a significantly different viewpoint Here's what the scripture says in the words of the apostle John. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So in the scripture, it's not your bravado or your bravery, your confidence or your calm demeanor, that's the opposite of fear. It's love. Because when you love God, you trust him through anything. And when you know that God loves you, you can rest in that love. The Bible says in that passage, fear hath torment. Fear is always looking for the negative report or the worst case scenario. Fear is always anticipating bad times and sad days. Fear is always dark and dejected and despairing. Fear is always distrustful and downhearted and despondent. Fear is always depressed and discouraged. Fear hath torment. But God's love casts out fear. And if I could give you a gift today, it would be the gift of God's love resting on your spirit, resting on your heart, resting in your home because perfect love casts out fear. Fear and God's love cannot exist in the same space, in the same place, at the same time. My dear missionary friend, Brother Steve Willoughby, wrote these words several years ago. I am confident in your love. I will not fear because perfect love casts out all fear. What is perfect love? Perfect love is when you choose to rest without worry or fear 
in God's ability to perform the completeness of his purpose in and through you. Perfect love is when you know that you know that the trial or the test has a definite point or goal in the purpose of God. Perfect love is when you have confidence that that trial will reach its prescribed limit. And at that time, God will give you a conclusion and God will give you a result that will be immediate, ultimate, and prophetic. My friend, he was so confident in God even when he walked through some of the worst situations. Hebrews chapter 13, one of the books at the end of the, Old, of the New Testament when the church is under all kinds of attacks from all kinds of places. The writer of Hebrews writes this. Let your conversation, your lifestyle, be without covetousness. D don't be greedy and grabbing for things that aren't yours. D don't let set your standard by all of the things in our culture. Let your lifestyle, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. You might not have the best life, but if you've got a life lived for God, you've got an amazing life. For God has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now in the Greek language, it's an amazing thing. And this is why pastors, they study the Greek language and the Hebrew language. It's not because they're trying to make you think they're smart or you know they're creative or clever. It's because sometimes there are some beautiful shades of meaning in that language, the original language of the text. For example, in English, we've got one word for love. I love my dog, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love my grandkids. It's all the same word. But in Greek, there's several words for love with shades of meaning. And so in this verse, three times there is a negative before one verb, and it emphasizes it so powerfully. Out of all the translations and paraphrases of Scripture, I think the old classic amplified version picks this up the best. And here's what it says. Let your character or your moral disposition, let it be free from the love of money, including greed and avarice and lust and craving for earthly possessions. Put that away. You don't need that. And be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he, God himself has said, watch this. I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. Here it is. Three negatives precede one verse. God literally said it this way. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So, we take comfort and we're encouraged and we can confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified because here's the bottom line. What can man do to me with a God like that? Why would I ever be afraid of anything else? You don't have to be a slave to sin or a slave to fear. That's the promise of the gospel and of the Holy Ghost. That spirit of bondage, slavery, it was canceled at the cross. You have now received not the spirit of bondage or slavery, but you've received the spirit of salvation or adoption. You are God's child and you can be confident in his love. Here's what Paul wrote. You have not received the bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I remember walking across a park in the city of Jerusalem uh, just in view of the old wall. And uh, Beverly was with me. We were walking across that park and there was a beautiful little Jewish family. They were throwing some kind of ball or Frisbee or something with their tiny little children. And they were beautiful people, Orthodox Jews serving God in all of the revelation that they know and they understand. And they keep all of those ceremonies and they keep all of those feasts and festivals as best they can with the loss and the vacancy of having a temple. They're precious people. 
But that day, that wasn't what took me. It wasn't their dress. It wasn't their modesty. It wasn't their attitude. It was this. Those little children with giggles and laughs were running around. And when their dad would throw it, uh, that ball or that frisbee, they would be wanting to catch it. And they'd want him to throw it to them. And you could hear them clear across the park. Abba, 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 Daddy, Daddy, throw it here. And that is what God is looking for from you. God is not distant. God is not unconcerned. God is not aloof to your problems or your situation. He is Abba, Daddy, Father. If it's big enough to make you concerned, it's big enough to make God concerned. If it's big enough that you're dealing with it, it's big enough for God to deal with it. And he is waiting to hear from you. I close tonight with well-known, often quoted words from the very last letter that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. Paul knows that his time is short. Paul knows that he soon will be leaving a huge responsibility on the shoulders of Timothy, his young son in the gospel. Timothy will face things that Paul never faced. Timothy will need answers to questions that Paul never considered. Timothy will encounter situations that trouble his faith and try his patience and test his resolve. I remember a few years ago now, still a relatively young minister and a young man, I remember when some of my precious elders started calling me I had always called them for advice. I'd always called them for counsel. But I remember well when some of my esteemed elders started calling me and saying, Pastor Raymond, we never faced this in our ministry. We never faced this when we were pastoring a church. What do you think we should do about it? How do you think the Bible would tell us to deal with this? How should we counsel? How should we pray? How should we respond? They had encountered situations that they had never faced before. And right now, we're in a situation we have never faced before. It can trouble our faith and try our patience. It can test our resolve. But in the very last letter Paul ever wrote, this is what he said to young Timothy. He said, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Those Greek words, they're amazing. They have such depth and meaning. Let me just summarize. If you're feeling nervous or timid or frightened or anxious or panicked or fearful, please know, number one, those feelings did not come from God. Number two, please know this, lock it in your spirit. Those feelings are just feelings. You don't have to listen to your feelings. You don't have to obey your feelings. You don't have to buckle under your feelings. Those feelings are just feelings. And number three, because you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you have the power and the authority to rebuke those feelings. God has given us the spirit of power. That's supernatural strength. He's given us the spirit of love. That's a supernatural love. And he's given us a sound mind. That's a supernatural self-discipline and self-control. See, your flesh will run out of control with fear if you let it. You give your flesh an inch, you give your mind an inch, and it will take a mile. But you hear me, brothers and sisters. You are a child of God. You do not have to be bound by your emotions. You do not have to be bound by your circumstance. Because God said, fear not, I will be with you. If you'd allow me to extrapolate from God's most common command and his most common promise, I would say to you tonight that in the middle of a viral pandemic that is shutting down borders and businesses, airlines and hotels and entire cities and states. In the midst of that, 
God's word would be. Don't you be afraid. I am with you. Yeah, I'm with you when you come to the church and you're all together and there's so many of you that's praying together that you can feel the vibration of the Holy Ghost. It's easy to have faith there, but God said, no, no, no. I'm also with you when you're all alone. I'm also with you when you're at home. I'm also with you when you're trying to bear up under this terrible sickness or this horrible situation or this unfair circumstance or this heavy trial. I will be with you. So fear not. I'd like to pray with you tonight. I'm so grateful you've joined us. Our next online service will be this Wednesday night. We won't be doing any music that night. It will be straight Bible teaching beginning at 7 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. And we'll be here for an hour studying the Bible. It's part two of the series Scattered, a study of First Peter, and I hope you'll join us. But right now, if you'd connect with a family member or a friend that may happen to be there with you, I'd like you to pray for each other because watching a prayer, <laughs> that's not praying. Uh, listening to somebody pray a prayer over a webcast, that's not praying. But right there in your home, you have the power to reach out and touch God. You have the power to call down the presence of God, the Holy Ghost from heaven. And I'm really believing it's happened already this week all across the width and the length and the breadth of our fellowship. When we were online this morning, I noticed a few people in the comments when I was talking about we can have children and people and family members receive the Holy Ghost in our homes during this time. Did you notice that two or three people said, I received the Holy Ghost in my home. I received the Holy Ghost kneeling at my bed. I received the Holy Ghost when I wasn't in the church building. God is not limited by this current situation. Reach out to somebody, would you right now? Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for the honor of speaking to your people tonight. I thank you for the honor of opening your word and sharing it. And I thank you, Jesus, for our church, which is not really ours at all. It's your church. So many people are afraid. So many people are in a panic. So many people are feeling despondent and depressed and hopeless right now. So let the church arise with anointing to do exploits for your kingdom. Jesus, use us in our homes. Use us in these small settings that we've been forced into. God, if you could do it in the first century, you can do it in the 21st century. We are choosing to be careful. We refuse to be fearful. And we thank you for your promise. I will be with you. Let your blessing rest on every home that is watching, on every person that is watching. Let your blessing, your protection, and the covering of your blood rest upon the people of God until we're back together again. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.